Hey, I'm Nathan Crane. I'm Derek Crane. And we're the co-founders of Crane Factor and hosts of the Activating Greatness podcast. Activating Greatness is about living with greatness every single day, understanding yourself and being true to who you are and creating greatness in every area of your life. In today's episode, we're excited to have Joseph Gagnon from the High Performance Life here with us. Joe is truly an inspiring human being. Having completed six Ironman triathlons, 15 ultra marathons, and 34 marathons, Joe's a remarkable endurance athlete, and all of this at the young age of 57. In 2017, Joe ran six marathons on six continents on six consecutive days. Take that in for a moment. And he's the author of Living the High Performance Life, as well as the CEO of Performance T. Joe, thanks so much for being here with us. Oh, what a pleasure it is to be with you guys. Thanks for hosting me. Absolutely. Excited about uh, this interview today. And, you know, you are embodying what you might call living a high-performance life. And that's exciting and interesting to both of us and I think to many people watching and listening to this. And before we kind of dive into how you do all this, how you uh, – run these marathons, ultra marathons, how you're this endurance athlete, how you're running this business, how you're doing all these incredible things, and in your 50s, I might add. Um, I want us to start with kind of the foundation of what is your definition of living a high-performance life? Yeah, so it's taken a little bit of a while to figure that out, you know, because the one thing I want to make sure everyone listening understands, when we talk about high-performance, this is about each and every one of us sort of creating a better version of me. So we would all say that same thing, you know, a better version of me. It's not me versus Nathan or any of those kinds of things. It's like, you know, we're trying to sort of manifest the greatness that's inside of us. And I like to think about sort of four elements of that, sort of life, which is sort of the, the philosophies and beliefs that we have, learning, which is even having curiosity at the ripe old age of 57, but this sort of intense need to understand and know fitness which is a strong body carries a strong mind and then nutrition because what we put in our body absolutely makes a difference right. and so if you focus on each of those elements on a daily basis you know extraordinary things just start to happen and so i often think about you know we're, we're on this life's mission to to find extraordinary people doing extraordinary things and then when we find out is that most people are actually extraordinary. They sometimes just need to step into it. And so I look forward to talking to you about that today. Yeah, so what, um, what age did you start this journey of becoming an athlete or an endurance athlete? Yeah, so it's, it was certainly uh, not an early, you know, I was not the college track star or any of those kinds of things. And, you know, I graduated quite a bit ago and, Got the normal life going, um, working too much, 100 hours a week, had the kids and got the house and actually was rather successful in my business career. And at about the age of 40, you know, I realized I had hit sort of the greatest rut you could ever hit in your life. You know, I was making a good amount of money, had the big house, the car, the country club kind of thing going on. And. And I woke up one day and said, this just can't be it. This is like the rest of my life. And it just seemed a bit empty. And so what I realized was that I had sort of, you know, created this just single dimension of myself. And so I went out and, and sort of ran a mile and found it to be quite difficult. And I was at a, a conference and I tried a arm wrestling contest with a friend and I couldn't beat him. And I was like, wow, this just can't be, you know, I just didn't look so bad, but had just no strength, really. And so I set out on a path that said, well, maybe if I try and exercise, you know, one day a week, and then it turned into three days a week, and you know, we can talk about it some more. But ultimately, it got to this sort of, you know, this principled mind that said, I'm going to try and do something every day. Because really, if you think about it, you know, we do three things every day that I know of. We eat, we sleep, um, <clears throat> we brush our teeth. And, um, but really, maybe we should eat, sleep, brush our teeth, and exercise. And that way, what we start to do, again, is this, this strong body carries a strong mind. And, and so 
the fitness piece both became this desire to make a commitment and then follow through, the need to practice and then perform, and then after that to get the benefit, as I said, this resiliency that's created from a strong body allows you to just take on other both, you know, sort of emotional and intellectual challenges because you have something that you can carry it with. And so, yeah, it's been 17 years of a journey. I didn't actually run my first marathon until I was 49. So the 60 or so marathon distance races I've done have been actually in the past eight years. So it's quite a few every year. And I just set goals and amp it up every year. And my God, it's just been an amazing run. So did you feel at that time you were 40, you had all the success and money and house and cars and all these things so many people aspire to, which obviously there's nothing wrong with that, but you started feeling a little empty and like you weren't having the, the meaning and fulfillment that you, you thought you might. Did you feel when you went out and ran a mile and you tried to arm wrestle something, did you just feel like physically you were weak and that began to inspire you to want to have more physical strength or was there something deeper there as well emotionally or mentally that started driving you at that point i think that you know so much of our lives is is actually this opportunity to sort of put a mirror up and look at ourselves and ask us about what are we worth you know why am i here and yeah. what do i believe in and i think what happened was the reason this this physical thing was just about me letting myself down mm. you know it wasn't about what anyone else thought. This was really, is this what I've chosen to do? And did I really respect the capability that I have by not really trying to take care of myself, you know? And I think that unless you start to take care of yourself, you're actually probably not even good to the other people around you. And so, you know, you might get a little wound up when you shouldn't, you know, you might not actually be as balanced as you might like. And so, yeah, it was about getting strong but not because I was trying to like, you know, wear a muscle t-shirt as much as it was to try to actually instill the disciplines in our lives that are the elements that actually start to, to raise what we're capable of. Yeah. And so the physical piece, just like sports, they're measurable. You can do five push-ups today and six push-ups tomorrow and, and it's very measurable and it's about you and it's about you. And so when you get that into your head, then you realize, like, I, I have a commitment to myself. I do push-ups every night before I go to bed. And there are just some times when you're tired or you just don't feel like it or you've done a lot and you're like, ah, I don't need to do that. And then I ask myself, really, that's your excuse? Like, you know, there's no one there with you. You can't just say no to yourself. Like, if you do that, then, then I don't know what we're worth. And so... So I do it to just keep myself, you know, alive and fresh. And to your word of greatness, I I think that's a very bold word. But it makes me feel great when I know that I can battle those demons and break through and do something that I've decided to. And I feel wonderful after that. I love that you said that because that's really what activating greatness means for us. It's like it's not just for the elite person at the at the top of the pyramid that you know they have all the followers and fans and money that oh they have greatness it's it's exactly what you're doing and and talking about which is greatness to us is really about you know embodying that will within yourself to to set goals and achieve them to follow your passions and your bliss, to make a difference in the world, to step up and lend a helping hand to somebody in need. You know, just those, we all have those moments of greatness in our lives. And, you know, for us, it's like, how do we activate that more within each of us, whether it's going out and, you know, committing to running an ultra marathon or it's opening a nonprofit to help, you know, children in Africa or it's it's just taking better control of your health. How, what are those processes and steps and motivations that it takes to actually start experiencing that greatness within yourself? Because I believe we all have greatness within us. Oh, and you don't have to be a millionaire or, or at the top of the leaderboard to, to embody that. It's just, you just have to step into that discipline every day and believe that you can experience those things and then go out and make it happen. 
which is yeah. what you're doing, and, and that's what's awesome about what you're doing. So we have this sort of philosophy both in my life and in Performance T, which is that human potential is infinite, and that we want to help people achieve their potential, whatever that might be. And so, yeah, I think that the interesting part about this is <clears throat> there's this, this step in the process that's really important, <clears throat> excuse me, where what you've got to realize is that the commitments that you make in your life have to first be to yourself. And then once you do that, then you can make a commitment to someone else. And that is where success happens. Because you can't actually commit to someone else unless you've already made that agreement inside you. Because that's often what breaks down, is that we sort of say, yeah, Nathan, I'm going to go meet you tomorrow morning and we're going to think about a business plan or we're going to run a mile or we're going to play tennis or we're just whatever. But if you haven't sort of decided that that's indeed what you're going to do, then often it breaks down and other things get in the way. Right. And so you have to have thought through that commitment model because it's a very important element of actually how we become better at what we do. Because then, you know, like part of my method was I created a spreadsheet and I started writing down every day what I did. So now I've written down every day what I've done for the past 17 years. So we could go back and look at 2005 on Wednesday of October 10th and we could see what I did. And the, the, the reason I did it was to keep myself accountable. You're talking specifically like exercise routine, what you did for the day. Yes. Nice. And so that actually helped get me to that accountability that I was like, oh my God, I better fill something in in that spreadsheet. And so over the past 10 years, I've only missed four days. Wow. And those were days that I took off because it was after an Ironman race and someone convinced me that I should take the day off. But I'm now realizing that isn't necessary either so, <laughs> so it's been part of you know creating practices in our lives that are the techniques that help us achieve the objectives that we set well i'm just plugging in those numbers into my calculator because i'm curious so that's point zero point zero one percent so 99.9 percent .9 you have been uh committed to your process over the last 10 years. Now, that's, that's remarkable. Um, and I know that for so many people, you know, that want to lose weight, that want to get healthier, that want to be fit, that want to have more strength and more energy and all these things, they know, well, I need to exercise more and I need to eat better. And I need to sleep better and I need to think better, right? But the reality is, like, how does somebody get that level of commitment and dedication so that they can actually follow through like you to be at that 99.999% of success. Well, you know, we start small, right? I said I ran one mile, you know, one year. And, and it's been, you know, remember, it's life learning and fitness. So I wanted to learn one year. I decided I should read a book a week, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to watch TED Talks because that was a way to learn. And one year I watched a thousand TED Talks. And so I would set different kinds of objectives for myself. But it's pretty good to just say, you know, maybe I'll watch one TED talk a month, you mm -hmm. know, set the goals that are achievable and then they build on themselves because it creates a foundation that becomes a bigger and deeper foundation. And then on top of that, you can take on more strain and more load. And we have lots of time, you know, we're living much longer. And, and, you know, this sort of, I don't believe in this anything called second half of life. I mean, I'm stronger and fitter and smarter and happier at, 57 years old and I was at 30 years old. I mean, it's like, uh, it's an amazing result that happens. And the things that I can take on are because I made choices, not because I had privilege. You know, I started as, you know, a low to middle income kid living outside New York City, you know, in the typical Italian family with nothing, you know, we didn't go out to dinner. You know, you got your one outfit a year, you know, I had no money. I started with nothing, but it is the choices that you make. And, and one of the things is I think sometimes we're waiting for permission to do something. And I often tell people is don't wait for permission. You're in charge of your life. Right. So, yeah, there are some people who say, you know, I got, you know, a single parent and I have two jobs and I can't fit it in and the kids and we can. There's 24 hours in a day, 168 hours in the week. Dedicate a little bit of that to yourself. 
and there's no reason you shouldn't. And then maybe you should watch a little less Netflix or maybe, you know, just do something that's for you. It's really important. It makes you a better person and actually makes everyone around you better. Beautiful. Yeah. Well said. I love that. Start small, right? Yeah. I love it too. I'm just, I'm, I'm sitting back and just soaking all this in and appreciate you uh, telling your story here. And the one thing that I'd love to ask is this um, adventure, this journey that you went on, six marathons, six continents in six consecutive consecutive days that's yeah. a in and of itself so well what i'd like to ask is what was the most challenging aspect of all that and then how did you overcome that challenge yeah so the the idea behind it and you know and one of the things also are in the early part nathan you know, like when you're talking about it, it wasn't just about the athletics it might be about doing something else so i was trying to raise some money for kids uh, in high school who are underprivileged, who live in poverty. And so I was trying to connect a big event with actually a bigger cause as well. So just putting that as one of the purposes, and I was trying to bring attention to both. Um, the first part that was the hardest was actually being able to figure out the logistics. So I didn't have any help. I had to figure out how to go around the world fly 37,500 miles, you know, get from place to place and be able to do this in that six days. And the reason everyone might ask why I didn't do the seventh day is you can't include Antarctica in a commercial flight path. So you'd have to start with a charter and I wasn't going to go charter a plane. I wanted to add the challenge of flying in coach. I wanted to have the unknowns of whether the weather or anything would get in the way of me. I wanted to make it you know, significantly, you know, maybe unlikely that it could happen because that added to sort of the, the challenge. So I did find out the flight path. It was Sydney to Singapore, Singapore to Johannesburg, Johannesburg to London, and then London to Sao Paulo and Sao Paulo to Los Angeles. So once I figured that out, um, I then had to work on, you know, the logistics. And I got people, I know people around the world and sort of asked them to help me and they all said yes, which was great. I gave them a plan, which, by the way, none of them followed. They all did, <laughs> they all did their own thing. And, um, and you know, a lot of people said to me, well, you know, there's a lot of things that could go wrong. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go find out. I'm just intently curious what it's going to feel like on day four or day two or in a plane for 12 hours every day or getting stuck in a middle seat or, you know, could I control my emotions in this entire week so that I could have success? And so I think what ended up there, you know, really at the end of the day, I mean, I'm somewhat privileged to have been able to do this. I don't think anything was hard, but the hardest day was running in Singapore. We, um, we started at five in the morning and it was 90 degrees and 90% humidity. And um, that's a heat index that you really probably shouldn't be out in. And we're running along and I'm going pretty good and it's a little bit hot. And I got to mile seven and I had my very small crew that day. And I, I said to them, I said, oh, you know what? I could really use one of those Gatorades. And they look at each other and like, oh, I think we left it back at the, the starting point. I'm like, oh, okay. Could I have a towel just like so a wipe my face? I'm sweating like, oh, uh, we forgot that too. We had no calories, no electrolytes, nothing but water. And water's nice, however. Yeah. It's nice not helping me. So it was too early in the morning for any of the stores to be open. I just had to keep running. And But more than anything, probably the thing that was the most amazing at that moment was I couldn't get, you know, um, angry at the guys. I just had to sort of let it be because it wasn't going to help. Telling them, you know, what's the matter with you? Why didn't you do what you were supposed to do? It's like, you know what? This is part of the struggle. I just have to keep going. And, you know, by the time we got to mile 15, they finally found uh, some local Gatorade-like thing. And I drank like nine of them in the next eight miles and sort of helped me recover. Uh, it was hard. You know, those last three miles, I, you know, struggled to the end. It was uh, it was internal battle with, you know, just start walking and I just didn't want to. But, but I think the hardest thing to do in a setting like that was to not hand – any of the burden to anyone else, carry it yourself. It made them feel better. 
it, they already, I knew they sort of already not that happy that they didn't support me in the way they wanted to. Uh, but it was a big and interesting lesson. But probably the most other important part of the whole week was in every situation, every location, someone else did more than they've ever thought they were going to do. You know, I had someone who ran a 10K alongside me and had never done that. In Sao Paulo, one guy wanted to come along, but he couldn't run and he didn't know how to bike. So he brought a scooter. He wanted an experience. He did 42 kilometers on a scooter. And he wrote me a note the next day and said, I hadn't had that much fun since I was a kid. You know, in South Africa, the kids that came up from Cape Town to Joburg to run with me, the hugs at the end and the, the spirit and hope that came from what we were doing was just amazing. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, was it hard? Sure. You know, every time you start resting, you got to go run again or get on a plane. And, but really, at the end of the day, it was the most amazing experience I could ever have. And I was just thrilled to be able to experience it, see how it felt. And then at the end, you know, when we crossed the sort of the finish line and we finished at the New Road School in Santa Monica, California, and I met some of the kids in middle school, and we just started talking about their dreams and what did they want to do. And you know, the way they lit up and felt the energy that was there was just amazing and remarkable. And so, yeah, probably one of those just moments in life that I you know, couldn't recreate. Just so happy I did it and hope it inspires other people to take on, you know, big challenges themselves. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, it's inspiring us for sure. And I'm, I'm sure many people are being inspired by, by your story and, and what you've accomplished. And yet you still have so many more things on the horizon. <laughs> right? Tell us about some of your upcoming adventures. Yeah. So uh, this year, also, just uh, in keeping with that theme, I actually went to Guatemala in uh, April, and I we summited seven volcanoes in seven days, all of them up over 10,000 feet. Um, we did that also to raise money for the kids of Guatemala, and um, didn't one of them? It was quite an incredible one of them blow, like right after you left or something. Yeah, you know, the same volcano we climbed yeah. actually erupted in a way that was very dangerous, and unfortunately. People did wow. lose their lives, and we were right there. And, uh, yeah, in the, the Earth's clock, I probably was about a second away from that happening, if you think about the, the implications. But, yeah, we did that. This year, um, I've run four ultra marathons. I have another one in two weeks, and then a 100-mile race at the end of October. Uh, we're working on the big plan for next year. There's a couple of big challenges that uh, – you know, probably by the November time frame, I sort of lock in the challenge for the year after. Um, I'll continue to raise the money for the kids, certainly in Guatemala. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it's it just becomes part of your life. And I couldn't have imagined of being able to do this and sort of, you know, do five or six or ultra marathons in a year. Um, you know, probably the road marathons. I mean, I did run Boston this year and it was the fifth time I got to do that, which is just an amazing marathon. Uh, but, you know, there's this, the greatest part about it is every time you go, you learn something else about yourself. You know, even the most prepared, sometimes you're not as prepared. It's just, it's just a good thing to build into. And I think that over time, you know, you'll just get this great sort of, you know, uh, emotional benefit from doing that. So it's, um, it's a really beneficial thing yeah I, I mean I have to agree I try to inspire everyone around me and encourage them like just to start running because it was really interesting I, I found running uh, when I went to Costa Rica and this was just a few years ago like two or three maybe three years ago and I was filming for a documentary series on sustainable living mm. and I was with uh, a gentleman who was in his 60s and he told me he runs up and down the mountains like 20 miles at a time. And he's like super fit. He's like a mostly fruitarian, vegan guy, super high energy. And I'm just like, I want to be like that when I'm in my 60s and 70s, you know? So I was like, I better just start running. So I actually started running with him a little bit while I was there. Came back. Uh, I, I believe it was him or someone around that time that encouraged me to read the book Born to Run. A lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of runners, I'm sure, have. Book, yeah. Read that book and I immediately decided, you know what, I want to run an ultra marathon. 
And, and I never even ran more than a mile in my life. <laughs> so um, I didn't sign up for one yet, but I just started running two, three, four miles here and there. And I was just kind of like playing with the idea. Um, and I was also, I'd been working on a huge business venture that was taking all my time, energy, money, passion, everything for a couple of years. And that ended up being a huge success in one way, but financially being a massive disaster. And <laughs> came out of that and was like depressed for a couple of weeks. And, and like, oh my God, I made all these mistakes and, you know, so worried about the people that were a part of it and just felt so bad and didn't quite have, you know, didn't quite have the wisdom of how to really handle that. And then I just started running again and I just, I was like, you know what, I'm just signing up for an ultra marathon uh, in, uh, I think I signed up for one that was like scheduled four or five months out. <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to do it. And I think what happened in that journey was like, it helped me rebuild my confidence. It gave me a goal that like, I was the only one responsible for, you know, I was, and I had to commit myself to doing it. And, and that journey of building up to something that not having running experience, not having you know, enough time to really, people run for two or three or four years before they usually run an ultra marathon. They're just like, I just want to see if I can do it. Um, and, I, and I did it, and that accomplishment, it was 35 miles through the, the mountains of Prescott, Arizona. Nice. And that accomplishment you get from achieving something like that um, is so, like, emotionally beneficial, just like you're talking about. And I just wanted to share that because even somebody may – you know, just starting, sign up for a 5K or a 10K and just start walking and jogging a, a, a mile a week, a few miles a week and start getting out there and, and challenge yourself to it because accomplishing those kind of goals, I think, are so beneficial to the human psyche. Yeah, I think that, you know, there is a part where, you know, and, and we don't, this is not about running, right? This is about the power that we have inside us and reaching in and finding what that potential is like. You know, exactly. I, you know, I spent a, a, an extraordinary amount of time on, you know, the, the intellectual side. I'm intently curious. I love reading, love thinking, or if you don't even want to read, there's a, there's a thousand, a million YouTube videos, watch smart people, hang around with them. You know, these are the things that get us going. And so the thing though, that's interesting about exercise they're starting to prove is that, so if you start to be less active in your life, we allow the body to sort of decline. When we stay active on every level, the cellular infrastructure in our body continues to work. And so the coolest thing about the exercise at whatever level, playing tennis, walking, running, calisthenics, CrossFit, is that the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus actually start to grow because the neurotransmitter dopamine in our brain actually starts to generate the need for more cells. And so we actually get mentally stronger. And so it could put off dementia if you actually exercise and you stay active as you get older. It makes you more resilient. If you do happen to have a fall and you're strong, it actually protects the body. But even more than that, in that business setting, I was sort of chuckling a little. I've had my failures in business, but I don't take them very personally, they sort of fit into what I've created. The strength and power yeah. allows yeah. me to be resilient. And so it's like, okay, yeah. I always say, you know, there's only good days and great days. There's a few bad moments, but never a bad day. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be sad from time to time. But there's no reason for our life to have anything other than sort of the spirit of positive so that we can actually, you know, do something with it. And when we do, it's sometimes actually, we don't know. Like if you met me seven years ago and said I was going to do the Six Continent Challenge, I would have said that's ridiculous. I actually don't know what's going to happen next, which is also the beauty of life. But when you step into this stuff, it starts to develop and it's like a flower that starts to blossom and you just start to see like, oh my God, it's more and more beautiful. And so... You know, that is a part and parcel, like why we did the performance tea thing, which is try to give people some natural ways to put good nutrition in their body. You know, adaptogens, these super herbs that help us regulate our system better so the stresses of everyday life don't affect us. Have it in a tea, which we all like. 
Don't put sugar in there because we really don't need it. And have one about energy or focus or balance or recovery and build a system that actually allows us to take on some of these challenges. And so the other thing that to think about is, you know, put yourself in a community of people, you know, a community that has, you know, um, people like you or people you want to aspire to. We all want to help each other. You know, I love going out and doing stuff with people. I'm never racing anyone. We're out there supporting, helping, making each of us reach our potential. And that's the magic. And that's why I love what you guys are doing here. Because it isn't about some celebrity thing or some privilege. We have the same, we'll call it, uh, you know, mechanism and power inside us that every one of us can use. It's up to us to choose to do that. Yeah. I, I love how you worded that. And talking about the performance tea that, that uh, this company you've created, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a plug for your company here. I want to show everybody that this is one of the products that I actually take that, um, that I love because it's all natural herbs, mushrooms, and reishi green tea, licorice, great things for the kidneys, adrenals. You know, that's been my focus for over a decade. Health and healing specifically through nutrition and diet and meditation and and uh, using holistic practices with Eastern practices and and one thing I love about your products specifically is that they are clean and they work and so you know I want people to to recognize that a huge part of living uh, with greatness in your life is having the right nutrition right? It's eating clean, it's putting clean liquids into your body, not putting lots of sugar into your body, not eating a lot of fast food or greasy foods. And one of the best ways to heal your body is through herbs, right? You also spent a number of years now really experimenting with and studying herbs as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm actually having a cup of <laughs> tea. <laughs> and I, I, I do got to say that um, I was feeling like a little, a little lethargic before, and even um, thoughts like kind of just kind of that little maybe going into full rest recovery mode. And mm. I jumped out drinking this from boxing this morning. From boxing this morning, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm having a cup of this, and I do gotta say that I'm noticing clean energy with without that spike from maybe you know if you do espresso shots or something that has a lot of caffeine in it. Right. Um, and also mental clarity. So I can tell those two things right off the bat. Well, and, and he's boxing. Derek started boxing with some pros here in Santa Fe. <laughs> yeah. He's training. Wow. So who knows? We may see him on a, in a ring here soon. Yeah, we have uh, some on the high end of this, just to show the, the, the potency and efficacy of the tea. We have ultra marathoners, MMA fighters. We have CrossFit people, golfers, gamers, students busy moms, executives, all can use products like this. What's so interesting is that we're sort of retraining some of the thinking in the American mindset, which is that life doesn't come in a pill. Right. You know, that actually it comes out of the ground and that we can actually, you know, make ourselves heal by what we eat. Now, I will say, because I think it's really important with everyone on uh, listening to your podcast that um, there isn't anything about perfect, okay? There isn't someone who for you know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, is living this sort of idyllic life. You know, I always say there's 21 meals in a week. It's okay if you have dessert on two or three of them or maybe some French fries or whatever you want. It's not, you can't do bad on 21 of them. But, you know, 17 or 18 of them, if you start there, it's like, so we don't put ourselves into a losing situation when we start, you know? And so, so much of this is about, you know, we're actually trying to move in a direction. It takes a little bit of time to do that. And so products like this can help, but there's other really good things. You know, superfoods are great to eat. Um, you know, eating probably a little less meat sometimes, less processed foods. You know, I've written about it in my book. You know, if you can find stuff that has less than seven ingredients, that's a good thing. You know, there are little rules that we can take to the decisions that we make. And you can find when you do that, that you feel better. I mean, I 
you know, I push the envelope every day. I don't sleep a lot. I know you're supposed to, but because I eat clean, exercise, I keep a clean mind, I can actually do that. It's when you have the burdens of all that other stuff, when you got to work hard to clean yourself up and you need to sleep eight or nine hours because you actually didn't treat yourself all that well. Right. And that, that's where, you know, I see a huge difference as well. And through nutrition and through my diet is that it kind of helps carry some of that load where if you're overworked or overstressed or not getting enough sleep, if you, if you pile on bad food on top of that, you're going to, you're going to really feel it. You're going to really feel like crap. But if you're putting in good herbs, more plants, organic, less chemicals, green juices, smoothies, all these things that are just, you know, part of, part of my life now, um, you, you can get through those, those challenging times a lot easier is what I noticed. Yeah. I think that I've been on that journey. You know, one of the things that, um, like, so I'm a vegetarian now and I used to be a very big meat eater. So 15 years ago, if you told me I wouldn't eat meat, I would have said, you're crazy. You know, it, it, same thing. Like if you had told me I was going to run a marathon, I would have said, you're crazy. So what we have to do is get out of the mindset that says, I can't do that. So I always tell people, you know, and it's in the book and it's on the stage when I talk, which is that the word can't is a useless word. Like say I won't do something, so take responsibility for the decisions you make, but don't say you can't. There's no reason. Because just time, give yourself time, put yourself in the community, make the effort and the attempt, and over time these things just, they come together. But when you say can't, it's like you already decided. Why should you decide before you even tried? It's like, it's sort of silly. So I don't allow anyone to say can't, and if you want, you know, to get out and do something, all of us will help, right? That's the key. There are so many people who will help all of us on our journey. And that's what we love to do. And so you're never alone, whether they watch this podcast or connect with one of us or find other people in your community. Um, and, and the age thing, you know, that's just silly, you know, because I know that I have just gotten stronger, smarter, better, feel good, more so every year. So that I actually keep looking forward to it. I was like, tell people, come chase tomorrow with me because that's going to be fun. Nice. Well, Joe, it's been fascinating talking with you, hearing more about your story. I mean, you truly are living a high performance life, a very inspiring life. And I know people listening uh, hopefully got some really great uh, pieces of information from this. Everyone tuning in, I'd love to encourage you, go over to Joe's website, performancetea.com. Yeah, is where you can check out his tea. He's got energy, recovery, balance. Uh, what's the other one? Focus. Focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should be drinking that right now. I've actually, I've actually got it on my, in my cupboard, though. So, uh, yeah, and then the book is for sale on Amazon, Living the High Performance Life. And then I have been a blogger for five and a half years. I've blogged every day. And so you can check that on the highperformancelife.net. I'm um, also post on Facebook under the High Performance Life. So you can read my content on a daily basis if you like as well. Awesome. So as a final question here, as we close out, what is one thing, I know this can be hard to answer because there's many, but what is one thing that you would encourage people to do to activate, live, experience more greatness in their lives? Yeah, I think it really comes down to make a commitment to do something, write it down, and then follow through. And every time you do that, that will move you further and further towards greatness because you'll just do more and more and it'll just build and build. So make sure you write it down and do it and then see how it feels and you'll be on the path to greatness forevermore. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joe. And uh, thank you all for tuning in here. This is the Activating Greatness podcast. Uh, you can leave us your comments here. This is on YouTube. It's on iTunes. It's on Spotify. It's all over the place. We'd love to hear your feedback for everyone tuning in. Uh, comments, questions. If you like this, please give it a thumbs up and share it on all your favorite social media places. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. And you can also join our newsletter free where we send out uh, inspiring content every week at cranefactor.com. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll talk to you next week. Take care. Awesome. Thanks guys. See ya.